Welcome to the Influential Motherhood Podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Duncan, and my dream is to inspire moms to pursue their goals and help them make a difference in their world. I'm a mom of two young boys, a wife to my high school sweetheart, and a lawyer. This show is a place to hear stories of moms working hard to have a positive influence in their profession or their community, and sometimes both, even as they juggle their responsibilities at work, at home, and to their children. You'll get tangible, practical tips for managing the chaotic world of motherhood and work. Come along as we hear these stories and feel inspired to step outside of our comfort zone as leaders and as a positive force within our communities. I believe that moms can change the world. I'm very excited that on today's podcast, I have Becca Stevens, who is based in Nashville, Tennessee. She is the mom of three and is a speaker, author, priest, and is founder and president of Thistle Farms. And you've probably seen Thistle Farms products online and in stores. I know that we have products in our local Whole Foods. I, I gifted some, yeah, I gifted some candles to my coworkers uh, for Christmas last year. So, um, Becca, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm excited to have this conversation today. Oh gosh, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for asking me. Yes, this is going to be, um, I think, a really important episode for the moms who are listening. So, I f- I would like to start out kind of thinking about you know the fact that you have a lot of titles now, all the things I just read off, and and I'm sure even more than what I said. But take us back because I want to go back to before you were an author and mom and priest and speaker and founder and president of Thistle Farms and go to Becca as a little girl and tell us what, when someone said to you, Becca, what do you want to be when you grow up? What was your answer to that question? Wow. I don't even remember. Yeah. (laughs) I don't even remember. I mean, that's like, so that's like, whew, that's ancient history. (laughs) But part of the problem, I mean, part of the reason, you know, I am a priest and part of the reason Mm -hmm. I am the founder and president of Thistle Farms, which is a global community of women who are survivors and advocates and volunteers for women's freedom, um, is because I went through that. So I wasn't, I was really more of in a survival mode when I was like five Mm -hmm. and six years old. My dad had been killed by a drunk driver. And I don't mean to bring everybody down right at the beginning of the podcast. No, that's part of your story, though. But I mean, that's my memory. That's my very first memory. And then after that, there was, you know, childhood sexual abuse that went on for about Mm -hmm. three years with a guy that came in. So, you know, what I wanted probably was safety. What I probably wanted was... um, you know, a sanctuary. And so I grew up to offer that to people. So in a a weird way, that is what I became is the things that I longed for. So it wasn't a job. I probably would have said gymnast. Yeah. But I, (laughs) I mean, I didn't do gymnastics, but I loved watching it. Yeah. I mean, I did it a little bit, but I think, you know, I think I became the things that I longed for, even at that little age when I didn't have the words around it. Yeah. Well, it was, I'm sure it was hard for you to think ahead to what you could be in what probably seemed like a, almost a luxury, you know, to, because that would involve safety and um, being taken care of to be able to, you know, be something and have a, have a job like that. But at that time, it was just what you needed. So, um, but I think I always also, and I think this is this is probably true for all moms mm-hmm. and all people going through this stuff. Is I also like I'm kind of doing what the same stuff I loved when I was a little kid. I loved arts and crafts. Yeah, and you know, and so I love doing that with my kids, and I love doing that in my work. You know, I love singing songs, gathering community. Yeah. Boy, you sure do that with your kids. You know, you do that Absolutely. as a priest. So in some ways, I'm just doing the same stuff. It's just now has a job title on it. <laughs> I love that. So you kind of made reference to it, and I did too. But let's jump right in and tell uh, folks about Thistle Farms and how it came to be. And then we can kind of talk through what being a mom has meant through all of this, pro- you know, the process of building Thistle Farms. Well, motherhood came before Thistle Farms. I was a mom mm-hmm. first. Um, I was married. I am married. I've been married 30 years now. I was married, newly married to a singer-songwriter and knew that I wanted a sanctuary for women and wanted to work and help women. But really, there wasn't any time. You know, when you got little kids, it's like 
if you get the laundry done, it's a miracle. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you just feel so proud. Yes. Or a shower um, even. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so my husband was on the road. We had a four-year-old child and I was pregnant with my second child. And there, I have all boys. I have all three boys. Mm -hmm. And I was downtown doing a feeding program. And, you know, you just carry your kids along with you. And I did that. And we had finished the program. And, you know, I was trying to get everybody back in the car, do our thing. So I was getting my son. He's Like I said, he's four years old in the car. And while I'm trying to get him in the car, he's doing this thing where he's really arching his back. Yes. And it's really hard to get him in the car. And what's happening, what I realize is that he's looking up that where this feeding program was, it was outside of a strip club. And it's called the Classic Cat. And they had this huge poster of a woman dressed up like a cat. Oh and he said, Mama, why is that lady smiling? And it was this picture of a woman, really, it was just the really of a memory of a cat suit. Mm -hmm. And you know, it was just degrading and weird and, um, you know, the idea that we sell women for less than cats and yeah. dress them up and put them like that. And then we want them to smile the whole time. And I thought, boy, that is an innocent question because someday that's not going to seem weird to him. It's going to seem normal. Right. And that was the day that I decided, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to take whatever the cost is. You know, I'm going to take whatever the time is. I'm going to take whatever... That means for me as a mom, me as a priest, and I'm going to just open this sanctuary and this model for women. So really, it was my motherhood that launched me into this work because mm -hmm. I wanted my child to go, oh, we don't think that's normal. Yeah. And, oh, we love women and we respect women. And, you know, and he did. He, My son, Levi Humman, he's a country music star now. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's doing really well. And... He loves and respects and um, sings praises to women. <laughs> you know, I mean, he yeah. is he is a great guy, and he has always loved Thistle Farms, was raised around all those women. It was like the best thing I could do as a mom mm -hmm. without even really knowing it but thinking, oh, no, this is going to take up so much time. How am I going to do it? When really the kids come along and it becomes part of the family. Yeah. So there were... There, before we talk a little bit more about, you know, what the work is now and what Thistle Farms looks like now, there were obviously, I mean, from that very first moment when you were trying to get him into the car, some difficult topics that you had to navigate around, you know, women and women being um, sexualized, you know, as objects and um, just the the challenges in the types of things that women were going through that you were helping through Thistle Farms as you started it. And you had young kids. So how did you navigate those conversations with your kids around these difficult topics? Well, I just think, you know, I mean, it's like what I remembered from my growing up is that you know, I couldn't have told anybody what was happening to me because mm -hmm. I didn't have any words for what yeah. was happening to me. And so I never really shied away from the idea that adults can really hurt kids. And the worst thing is when we have to keep that a secret mm -hmm. and that if anybody hurt you, if anybody, you know, does something like we are the safest people in the world, this community is the safest because all these women have had bad stuff happen to them. Yeah. And then, you know, Lord, if you're in this world, it doesn't take you that long to figure out what that means. Right. Um, you know, and it doesn't take that long to realize that there's some really unjust systems and people have been hurting a long time and we can love them. We can love them back into community. We can love them so they can be with their kids, mm -hmm. you know, and have babies. Some of the women have babies after they come through the program. So... For me, it was a lot of language around love, like we're loving each other. This is really what love looks like. Yeah. And then when people haven't been loving towards each other and abused each other, horrible things, you know, can happen in their lives. And that's why, you know, that's why you got to be for the underdog. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you got to you got to cheer for the people just getting out of prison and just do whatever you can to help them find that safe space. Yeah. Yeah. That's I think that's kind of the language. And then also the women themselves are just um, the women that came through or especially on the early years mm -hmm. were just phenomenal women, you know, and they end up being at your house and becoming friends and and then later on when you're like, "Oh my gosh, 
you know, those were all women yeah. who had come out of prison, all women coming off the streets. And the boys learned they were all at our house, you know, and we were sharing food and joy. And, you know, that's not what we need to fear. We need to fear when, you know, systems and communities break down. That's right. the bad thing. Yeah. So t- t- walk us through the development of Thistle Farms from then when Levi was four to now and how the program has kind of grown and developed. So I think, and I don't know if this is true for other folks too, but birthing a child is a really creative time and a really panicky time. Yep. (laughs) So the first house didn't open till after I had that baby I was pregnant with. And I had him in um, August of... 95. And that was about the same time I birthed the organization. It took another year and a half or almost two years to get women in the house. Mm -hmm. Um, And then it took um, another, I had my third baby in. So we we started housing women and we opened up a couple houses pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And about four years later, I had another baby and, and I, I started the, um, I said, hang on one second. I'm not doing a podcast. This is what kids do to you right here. This is a great living example. But um, um, so after I had my third child is when we started Thistle Farms Bath and Body Care Company, the manufacturing company. Okay. So it was like each child kind of was the beginning of a creative period. So we started this bath and body care company in 2000, it took again till about 2001 to start actually manufacturing. Mm-hmm. But it's grown to be the largest, you know, social justice enterprise run by women survivors in the United States of America. That is amazing. And all my that kids have worked there in their summers. <laughs> I love that. I love that. They've been, they have truly been part of it. Oh my gosh. You know, Levi laid the first floor. Caney, C-A-N-E-Y, our middle son, who is a beautiful artist, he did some of the first artwork for all the homes. He went on our, some of our first global team trips to help paint walls and design things. I mean, he's an amazing creative person. Mm-hmm. And our youngest son, Moses, I mean, he did manufacturing and brought along friends every summer for like five summers in a row. Oh, Wow. So it's That's been, awesome. yeah, it's like also it, it comes with summer activity. <laughs> <laughs> you have some built in interns by, right. by having your kids there along the way. Oh, one summer Caney did. So we have now, I mean, the model is a two year, res, you know, two year rent free, no authority in the house model, plus this workforce and economic independence pot piece. Mm-hmm. But there was one summer that Caney, our middle son, traveled to almost every community that we had at that time, you know, we would go and visit and we would help set up protocols and mm-hmm. do workshops and do fundraisers. And he did it, all of it with me. Oh, that's incredible. I know. But I loved what, it. And what, what a learning experience, you know, I mean, for, for a, to become a young man, having had that hands-on experience in something like Thistle Farms and being able to be there and go to all of those locations. It's just amazing to me that that is such a, a powerful way to learn about the world, you know, as as a young person. Um, and I think learning hands-on is so important. That's that's incredible. So now in the beginning, was it just you and your family kind of running the full operation? Well, full operation, that's like, there's a lot to be desired. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you had to, I mean, you had, you had the, the home, right? And, yeah. uh, feeding but people. And, there were and people, people um, there were always volunteers that were helping. There was, um, like a part-time executive program director mm-hmm. person. And then, um, I think we were the only two at the beginning, but pretty early on, um, then a social worker joined us, okay. especially once we did the second, um, especially since we did the um, second house, we had to start getting people involved and yeah. get people going. Yeah. So during that time, as you were growing Thistle Farms and the programs and, you know, being able to be there just right there with these women who were coming through as a mom, what were some of your biggest challenges in, you know, work and community and motherhood, especially when your kids were younger? 
So there were several, I think there were several challenges. One was, you know, I had to give up the idea that I'm going to lead this balanced life. Mm -hmm. I found that to be the most stressful concept anybody had ever given me. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, oh my gosh, I have to do all this and be balanced. Mm -hmm. You know, like, forget about it. Just forget about it. Just, you know, lean into the day, figure out what's ahead of you and, and just keep going. Yeah. I mean, that that was, was before, you know, Instagram had taken over our lives and convinced us all that there was some semblance of balance, right? I mean, oh, uh, people were worried about balance way before Instagram. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. But now it's you know now it's in our face, you know, potentially twenty four seven. But even before it was in our pockets and in our hands and in our face, I think you still thing, felt this pressure, right? I think the worst thing about the Instagram thing and mothering mm-hmm. for me is like. Oh my gosh, everybody looks so good. Yeah. <laughs> and my family does not look that good or whatever it is or this family, yeah. you know. Oh my it, there was just there's so much information about how everybody's doing everything. Yeah. And you can get tricked into thinking either you're better than you are or worse than you are. Right. You know, it's like, yeah. oh my gosh, that just is just don't look at it all I the agree. time. Yeah. I but agree. The so, other thing is what I was saying is the beginning challenges. Mhm. So um, you know, like one of the challenges was giving up the idea of balance that I was just going to just do what was and what I needed to do during the day. The second challenge for me is I'm not a super, super organized person. Okay. So like organizing kids, you have to do like easy, easy two things at one time. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's like the minimum. Yeah. <laughs> like I really need to be doing this conference call while I am, um, Loading dishes. Right. I really need to um, be writing a grant while I'm cleaning up after dinner. Whatever. You know, You. Ha- it, it was like, if you're not organized then, what happens is things get slipped through the cracks. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of stuff was slipping through the cracks. So I needed really to just really get the volunteer piece of it going make sure I was turning over leadership to women who were coming through and graduating early on yeah. because my organizational skills were not that good. That ended up being one of the biggest gifts. Okay. Tell us more was, about that. Well, it's like delegation by necessity, not yeah. because you wanted to delegate, but just like you can't do it. So you have to delegate. And then that ends up being like, oh my gosh, I'm increasing my donor base. I'm increasing my volunteer base. I'm inviting tons of people in. This is really growing because I have no idea what's happening. Yeah. You know, because really what it was, you know, I mean, so that was a challenge. And then always, always the challenge, I think, in all young organizations, and I've started seven organizations now. I mean, about $50 million later, seven organizations later, it's like, the hardest part is not the startup. The hardest part is like year two, year three, where you're not new and exciting, but you also don't have this great track record where people want to talk to you about it. Right. The beginning is fun. And yeah. then <laughs> when you get some notoriety, it's fun. But in between, you just have to, I mean, it is not about vision. It is about sweat equity. Yeah. Just grinding. And that was, yeah. Well, you know, that thing of like, you know, babies are amazing. And then they, you know, and high school graduations are amazing, but there's a lot in between. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in the middle. So. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. Right? Absolutely. And it's the same with organizations. It's like it's it's the exact same. It's like years pass quickly, afternoons drag by. That's Parenting a, and organization. So well said. So well said. When you started. Thistle Farms in the beginning and, you know, you were in that exciting period. So it was, you know, Thistle Farms was a newborn baby and it was new and exciting and the energy was there. Did you have a vision that it would become a global program or did you just think this is what my community needs right here, right now? Well, I really, I I didn't think it couldn't, wouldn't happen or I didn't think how it would happen and, or it couldn't happen. I really thought this was a beautiful model for how we love each other. Yeah. Yeah. That was the that was the idea, and really, you can't really talk about loving each other if we're not concerned about each other's economic well being. Mm-hmm. Those were the thoughts. It was yeah. like it was just going to be this big love fest, and however it grew was fine. Thank God, there's so many capable people that came along and developed a much more vertically integrated model, a much more expansive model, 
a much more aesthetically pleasing model than mm-hmm. I could have ever done. I mean, when you see a community like Thistle Farms, it's not Becca Stevens' vision magnified. It is a communal vision amplified. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's just the truth. I'm yeah. not being humble or no, anything. It's I, like, yeah. I have no idea how all of it happened. But when people ask me, like, are you surprised how big it is? Because, you know, whatever, you know, like all the global partners, all this national network, accelerator programs, all these things we're doing, all the products we sell all over the country. And it's like, are you surprised how big it is? And it's like, I can't believe we're not bigger. I cannot believe we're not competing with Burt's Bees. Yeah. I mean, I really yeah. can't. I mean, the products are every bit is good. Our mission is, you know, you can't compare it. I mean, I just can't believe it's not bigger. Forbes yeah. magazine did this story like a month ago. It said the reason Thistle Farms is so successful is we're a mission with a company, not a company with a mission. And I read that and then I think, why are we not huge? Right. And I don't know. I still don't know the answer. We are supposed to be expanding our footprint. That's what somebody told us. well you know i think i think as it's it's one of those you know this is my unprofessional opinion but you know as word continues to spread you know i know i found it just by hearing about it and i i made my path to i made my way to whole foods to buy those christmas gifts because i wanted to support the mission just like you said and and i knew the products would be great and so i think it's just continuing to spread the word and um and i think that over time it's just going to continue to grow something like this cannot not continue to grow good you know that makes me happy yeah yeah (laughs) That's that again. I have I do not have a business degree. I have a law degree, but that's my unprof- my unprofessional opinion. Well, yeah, you know, I, that's all you can have, really. I mean, all yeah. this stuff about how things grow and how they take on. I mean, is whoever you talk to has an opinion, and they're most of them, you know, are pretty informed by our life experience, yeah. and some of them are yeah. anecdotal. But it's like, I'll take it. I promise you, yeah. I'm grateful for it, and I'll take it. <laughs> Well, I think I I think that it's just such a beautiful mission. Are there things that you felt like uh, you it's because I'm going to back up on my question. It sounds like you were very willing over time to delegate and to find people who had skills in particular areas that you knew the organization needed over time. And so it sounds like there was a lot of saying yes in a good way you know, to expansion and to new ideas and to the expertise that people were bringing in. But can you tell us about a time or, or can you just think generally, were there times where you really felt strongly that you had to say no to something in either in motherhood or being a working mom or in growing the organization? Yeah, but those are harder to remember. The yeses are much easier to remember. Yeah. But but you because you, the you no's, feel like you said no. Because the no's yeah. definitely, I mean, they those are shutting things down, and then they kind of go away. Right. And it's hard to remember. But I do remember thinking sometimes, like, and I just thought this the other night. This is crazy. So my kids now, you know, are 18, 20-something, 23. No, I'm wrong. 19, 23, and 27. They're old. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I was in in San Francisco doing fundraising for mm-hmm. some of the global pro- programs we have. And it happened that my son was singing Levi Humman out on the stage. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, he was opening for a guy named um, Hunter Hayes. Yes. And they had a show out there. So I went to the show, and everybody that was with me went to the show, and we were just clapping, and I was looking at him and marveling at him. You know, he's in that just that beautiful star rising kind of phase in his life. Right. And I was thinking, I was looking at him going, that really is the most important work I ever did. Yeah. My kids are the most important work. So I think I would not have had a hard time. And it is hard. It is hard at the time, Mm -hmm. but to say no to some stuff. But when, you know, when you realize like I'm giving that up, I'm saying no. So I can say yes to whatever the present moment is with those kids I really, truly believe my three kids were the most important work of my whole life. Yeah. Yeah. And without a doubt. I mean, and especially, especially now when you watch them and, and like you said, they're living their own lives and, and, you know, it's just like, 
oh, I'm so glad whatever I said no to to give me 10 more minutes with them was a yeah. gift. Yeah. And it, and it, there's no doubt that that was the right choice to make. And the other thing I always said, always did, always, 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 I took the entire month of July off because if you are running a not for profit or two and running a church as a priest, mm hmm. You know, you're you're going, you're just going, going, going. So I always took a whole month off, which is seems unbelievable, but I just wrote it into everything I did, saying I will do nothing in July. And we would take long road trips. We would, you know, my husband's parents were living in Africa. We took, I think, three or four trips with all the kids to Botswana, Africa. Oh, that's amazing. Safari, or we would go, like I, I took a month-long gig in Wyoming. I took a month-long gig in Hawaii, like really small, not paying anything, but giving you housing for a mm -hmm. month. So we would spend these long summers together. And that, to me, always helped. It always helped me to have this dedicated time where it was like, it's not just the evenings or I'm not just cutting back. Yeah. I was completely absorbed in family. Yeah, I love that. And I bet those are memories that your kids have kept, you know, throughout their lives that those were really special times for them, I bet. I hope so. It's because the reason we don't have any money now. <laughs> But but the memories are good, right? The memories are rich, <laughs> the memories baby. Are... <laughs> That's funny. Hey, friends, popping into this fun episode to remind you to take a quick second to subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. And don't forget, you can also sign up for bonus episodes and content from my monthly newsletter at melissaduncan.com slash join. Thanks for listening, and let's get back to the show. So um, how have you continued to set goals as your work has grown and changed over time? Is there is that something that you do as a practice or you just kind of follow where it's headed next? I don't really do goals. Yeah. I do. I definitely do projects. Yeah. So okay. I have a lot of pro I always have a lot of projects in, yeah. in the works. And so maybe those are somehow they maybe they form like I have a goal or something, but it mm -hmm. always feel like it's like, oh my gosh, I can get really excited around this. Yeah. So I have a writing project. I just pitched it this morning to Harper Collins. Oh, um, that's exciting. They're the ones that that um, published Love Heals, mm -hmm. um, the book. And so I want to do a follow up to that. And so that's a project I'm excited about. And I was I have been waiting till I could get excited about it to yeah. do the next thing. So we'll see. I think I'll get started probably this summer with a oh, new That's wonderful. a new piece called Find Your Way. Oh, I love that. That's wonderful. And um I I know that Love Heals has been uh, you know just a, a tremendous piece of work and and a blessing for those who have, you know, had the opportunity to read it and um I think that you know as you are able to continue to write about your work and the mission. It's it's just going to continue to spread the word. So that's amazing. Mm. When you think about a young mom who, you know, if you reflect back to when you had a four-year-old, you know, a, an eight-year-old in the house, um, it, it, when you th think about a young mom who wants to be a leader in her work or her church or her community, what is one kind of takeaway piece of advice that you would have for her? Just trust that your kids are learning from what you're doing. Yeah. Just, you know, you're modeling it, even if you think they're not listening all the time or you think you don't have the right words around it or you you fret over how you're being pulled in different directions. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're they're soaking it all in. Yeah. And 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 you're that's the gift. I just think it's I think that's the gift. I yeah. mean, I always felt really pulled and my advice is just like it's not really pulling don't feel yourself being pulled maybe just think of yourself as modeling yeah that's the best I can do because otherwise I'm just going to say you know take advantage of free food that was the other <laughs> thing I mean always take advantage of free food I raised all my kids to be freegans you know eat <laughs> eat whatever is free People bring food over or you're out somewhere. It's like, eat it because that's all that's coming. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, th there are times when 
um, you know, we're somewhere and there's chicken nuggets and, you know, my husband's like giving me the side eye, like, didn't they have chicken nuggets last night? I'm like, you know what? Just go with it. It's fine. Just go with it. They're, exactly. They're, they're not going to turn into a chicken nugget because they eat it two nights in a row. <laughs> like, it's totally fine. It's Ugh. free and it's food and they like it and they'll yes. eat it. So, yes. Yeah, there we go. Um, I think that's great advice. And I, I think what you said about in the beginning about balance and the misconception about that is just incredibly important. I, I don't think as moms, we can hear that too much. You know, I think mm. we have to reiterate to ourselves over and over again, that balance is a myth. The only um, other thing I can think of that I would like to say mm-hmm. is that the other piece that was really good for me was like really simple rituals with my kids, really mm-hmm. simple. And like, because I make bath and body care products, you can imagine that I love oils. I love, mm-hmm. love oils. And the idea of having a little bit of lavender oil to put on my kids' feet, you know, we would, you mm-hmm. know, you, you don't say as a mother, I would like to anoint your feet. Yeah. <laughs> but you can say, I'd like to rub your feet. Yeah. Or yeah. put some drops in, in their bath or breathe some in for yourself. But yeah. like, or we're going to, we're going to have this ritual of this is our prayer at night, or this is how we go to bed. Yeah. And this feels loving and safe. And those things saved me. And my kids still know the prayers we said. They still want you to do their feet as big as they are. They still love the oils, still love the whole journey of, um, you know, just some of the rituals. They know yeah. them. Yeah, I, th- I love that. I love that. Well, it's obvious that your, your impact in both, you know, your community and church and with your kids has just made... A, a, just a, a, such a huge, um, I think, positive impact all around. Oh, so that's thank great. you. Yeah, and my, yeah. my heart goes out to everybody doing this. It's hard, and it it's, is hard, and it's so good, and it's so worth it. And also, the crazy thing is, is how, how, um, you know, it just it just changes so often. As soon as you get it down, something else changes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think um, it, it sounds like you've. You've been open to, over time, just listening to the Lord and, you know, just being open to letting people help you along the way so that this mission can continue to grow and grow and grow, which is just incredible. So um, we talked about the book. Is there anything else that is um, on your heart or in your mind about projects that we can pray for you about it or be on the lookout for? Yeah, I would say that there's um, there's like three or four new global partners, and I won't go into all the details, but small mm-hmm. groups of women around the world who are asking these same questions without near the same resources. Mm-hmm. And just to keep those, you know, moms who are really suffering with the violence and vulnerability of poverty in our hearts and in our minds, and to remember that, you know, as we purchase things or as we offer prayers, just to keep them in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm curious um, because I think that that is something that is so important to talk about that we haven't talked about. And as we, you know, buy with our products with these women in mind and as we pray for them, what's the takeaway? What's something that you learned from the women who are moms who have gone through your program? Because that, I'm sure, I'm sure you know, they, that, they taught you something as well. Well, the issues around motherhood are universal. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's, we just all remind each other, like, we want our kids to have access to health care. Mm-hmm. We want our kids to feel safe in their home. We want our kids to have decent clothing. Yeah. There's it's no nothing complicated. There. No, yeah. it's like, you know, like you can be in the middle of one of the groups we're working with is a refugee camp, refugee camp. And it's like, how can we get the kids to the dentists? Yeah. That's an issue, no yeah. matter where you are in the world. And so that's the kind of dramatic stuff we're dealing with. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you know, like just, you know, access to the basic human needs of life. And also, I think, though, it is like I, I've been saying lately, it's like if everybody that said they love Thistle Farms bought their soap from us, mm-hmm. I mean, we would be flush. Yeah. We would be able yeah. to help the next 50 women on our waiting list. Yeah. But it's like people say, you know, it's and it's it's extra work, and that's why it's hard, especially for young families. It's like people do love you, but it's really easy to pick up your soap at Target. Yeah, yeah. And so, that's so it's true. like order your soap from Thistle Farms, yeah. little things like that, and that's a story, and it has love heels on it. It's a teaching moment. It's all of those beautiful things. 
and it will make a difference for these. Oh my gosh, for, for our Huge. fellow moms, yeah, yeah, Huge absolutely. Difference. And the women who are going through the program. So, as we start to wrap up, tell us where people can find Thistle Farms products, and um, if, are there any other ways that we can support Thistle Farms and the work that you're doing? People can just go on the web, find Thistle Farms, go on Instagram, go on Facebook, go on Twitter, Thistle Farms, Thistle Farms. Follow me if you want. I'll lead you to all kinds of places that around the world that are working with moms at Rev. At Rev. Oh, no, no, it's just at Becca Stevens. That's my yes. thing. Yeah. And then um, I would say, you know, being, being social media advocates is a huge thing for us, especially mm-hmm. because it's our number one source of referrals for women oh interesting okay. isn't that interesting yeah. i didn't i mean that is new new information for me but it's a way that no matter where you are in the world or what's happening you can reach out and ask for help and then obviously the other thing is to continue to share our own stories of yeah. of survivorship of um you know truth telling and to empower our kids to be the same courageous beautiful people that we long for them to be by giving them the tools you know to feel confident to speak their truth to understand what justice means and how they can serve this world and love it i love it i love it well I am going to commit to buying my soap from Thistle Farms in addition to continuing to gift candles and, and other products. Um, I, it, it did feel okay, good. Okay, I'm holding to, you to I, it. I'm I gonna, promise. I'm a, I am I am going to watch. <laughs> I'm going to watch. I'll send on you our, my receipt. <laughs> they, no, no, I'll be watching. I can, you know, that's the crazy thing. You can see in real time people ordering. Oh, really? Isn't oh, that that's wild? cool? Yeah, that yeah. Is wild. And we can see when people abandon carts. It's the most heartbreaking oh, thing in the world. It's <laughs> terrible. It's awful. It's like you want to go track them down. Don't abandon your cart. I know. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, well, I will say, you know, when when I was thinking about gifts that would be impactful, um, or at least kind of you know, just feel good for, for my team members at work. And I thought about you and about Thistle Farms. I heard you on Annie Downs um, podcast last year. And so it was kind of sitting, you know, in my mind that this is a company or, you know, a nonprofit that I want to support. Mm. And um, when I gifted those candles, I could just tell that, you know, it was, it was different from just giving a, a gift card or a candle that I had picked up at Target that they could kind of feel the impact that, you know, these candles were made by women who were survivors. And um, I could tell that, that that meant something even for them to mm-hmm. just open it as a gift. So I I encourage others to do the same and to support Thistle Farms um, through, thank you. through purchasing. Yeah. And thank you for the work that you're doing and your encouragement for moms who might have something on their heart where they want to make a difference as well. I think you've given some great tips today and some encouragement. (laughs) And and I just thank you for for sharing your story here today, Becca. You're welcome. And thank you again. And keep going. You're doing beautiful. Oh, thank you, Becca. All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in for another inspiring episode of the Influential Motherhood Podcast. Be sure to follow my own journey in motherhood and work at Melissa Duncan JD on Instagram and follow the behind the scenes of the podcast at Influential Motherhood on Instagram and Facebook. If you're enjoying the Influential Motherhood podcast, please take a second to leave a rating or review in iTunes. It is how you can help other moms find the show so they can be inspired by these stories. See you next week. Thank you.